In the bitter struggle of the Republic of Vietnam to preserve its freedom against the organized infiltration and treachery of the Communist Viet Cong, the nature and form of military action recommended by United States Army advisors has been determined by three fundamentals. First, the nature and form of enemy action. Second, the Vietnamese way of life. And third, the type of terrain on which the action must be fought. The question became, how to carry this guerrilla-type war to the guerrillas in their shifting strongholds, off in the vast delta land, off in the plateau's jungle, off in the mountain's tangle, not to harry them from place to place, but to land troops and clean them out? The answer is the Helleborn Strike, in which the Army helicopter provides rapid troop mobility where there had been none and surprise where the Viet Cong had vanished into the jungle days before a reprisal force of Vietnamese could slog their way to the scene of brutal raid and terror. Now the Vietnamese themselves were enabled to plan a trap and spring it. What type of helicopters have been selected for this swamp fire action? How are they manned? How are they armed? And how are they used? What is the pattern that has been hammered out in the guerrilla battles of this historic Helleborn action? The H-21 troop carrier. Troop carrier is the big twin rotor H-21. When the Vietnamese division commander schedules a strike, 10 Vietnamese soldiers with their battle equipment are allotted to each aircraft. So the total load in the H-21 is 14 personnel, including the crew. The four-man American Army crew consists of the pilot, the co-pilot to his left, the crew chief, who sits up close to the pilot, and is the gunner firing the 30 caliber machine gun out the right side door. The fourth crewman could be termed the left door man. He supervises the movement of Vietnamese troops in and out of the aircraft and during flight as well as on arrival at the landing zone. He is ready with an automatic weapon at the left side door. So the H-21's only in-place weapon is one 30 caliber machine gun. However, whatever armament the troop carrier has is of secondary importance. The real and ample protectors of the H-21's in flight or at the landing zone are the turbojet armed helicopters, the UH-1A and its latter version, the UH-1B. They fly as armed escort to the airborne troop transports, just as the Navy's destroyers act as armed escort for seaborne troop carriers. Both the UH-1A and the UH-1B have an American Army crew of four and a Vietnamese observer whose duty is to distinguish between Vietnamese and Viet Cong troops on the ground. Americans are no longer forbidden to fire unless fired on but it is still good tactics to keep the Viet Cong under constant surveillance and when threatened with attack to overwhelm the enemy with prompt devastating bursts of retaliatory fire. The UH-1A armed helicopter. The UH-1A crew consists of pilot and to his left the gunner co-pilot with a crew chief 
and a gunner at the ammunition trays as loader. Armed with M2 automatic carbines, they cover the areas not swept by the fixed mount machine guns. Using this field expedient, they have been surprisingly effective and credited with several kills. The UH-1A's two fixed mount 30 caliber machine guns are mounted forward on the skids, one on each side. They are fired through an electro solenoid by the pilot. However, it had become evident early in the Vietnam type of operation that the target was not so much enemy soldiers as an area of vegetation in which enemy soldiers were skillfully hidden, rising to fire, then disappearing into dense cover. The fixed machine gun could not be depended upon to saturate such an area with lethal fire. The weapon needed here was the rocket, which would fragment and make any part of an area untenable. Accordingly, 16 launchers to fire the 2.7 rocket were installed on the UH-1A, eight to each side, so mounted on the skids that they fired to the side of the machine guns. This was done at Okinawa by local ordinance there before the aircraft were moved to Southeast Asia. The rocket has proved an ideal weapon for the armed helicopter. It deals most effectively with the Viet Cong in their favorite maneuver, the ambush. A combined machine gun and rocket run on an area smashes the hide and seek tactics of the guerrilla enemy. The UH-1B armed helicopter. When the UH-1B arrived from its manufacturer in the United States, it was apparent that its machine gun armament was designed for effective fire at all angles. Four traversable M60 machine guns had been provided, two for each side. They fire the NATO 7.62 round. The gunner co-pilot aims and fires through a movable type sight with a trigger set in the handle. This is the 7.62 machine gun system known in the Army as the XM-6 kit. The guns can be traversed 70 degrees to either the right or left of the aircraft. Also, they traverse up and down so that if necessary, they can fire directly beneath the aircraft. But while the UH-1B's machine gun system was a tremendous improvement over that of the UH-1A's, a rocket system was lacking. This weapon, overwhelmingly successful against the Viet Cong, was installed on the UH-1B after its arrival in Vietnam. Adapting the 1A's system, 16 rocket launchers were emplaced on the 1B by local ordinance, eight on each side. As with the 1A, the 2.75 is the rocket ammunition of the UH-1B. So, with the UH-1A's 16 rockets and two fixed machine guns, and the UH-1B's 16 rockets and four traversable machine guns, these armed helicopters were now ready and able to carry the fight to the hundreds of communist cells maintained by the Viet Cong in jungle, forest, and delta. The battle has not been without its casualties to those on Freedom's side. To take care of these, five UH-1As are on duty with the 57th Medical Detachment.
this Vietnamese soldier with a painful wound is flown to the hospital. An American army advisor was wounded when the Viet Cong sprung a trap on a ground party in the jungle. They employed their ambush tactics, which is to allow the unsuspecting Vietnamese force to pass, then to let go with all they have and retreat into the jungle. Air ambulances have red cross and the word ambulance painted on their sides. Not that those symbols are always respected by the communists. Medical care for the civilian population helps keep the air ambulances busy and is one of the human factors that are constantly improving the image of democratic America among the Vietnamese people. There are casualties also for tired metal, worn out in continuous combat service. Just after it took off with a heavy load of Vietnamese soldiers, a parts failure deadlined this troop carrier. On the spot repair will enable it to fly again. In another action, an H-21, bringing in its load of troops, settled down on what looked to be solid earth, mantled with grass which seemed to wave a welcome. Beneath the grass was the sharp edge of a drainage ditch. And when the H-21 hit that, it careened over on its side and stayed there. An H-37 could have carried it back to base camp. But there being no H-37 in South Vietnam, the big ship was stripped of all parts that might prove of value to the enemy or of value to the U.S. Army. When nothing was left but the shell, that too was denied the enemy. It was doused with napalm and reduced to a cinder. A Helleborn strike. Pilots of a utility tactical transportation helicopter platoon leave their quarters for the briefing area. As they will fly the five armed escort helicopters, the briefing must be detailed and explicit. The UTT briefing they will receive will be followed by a briefing from the transportation company of H-21 troop carriers that the UH-1s will support. The operations officer will give the briefing for today's strike. Three UH-1As and two UH-1Bs will comprise the escort for the H-21s. After the Vietnamese troops have been landed, all aircraft will return to the loading zone to rearm and refuel. Then the H-21s will make two more trips to the landing zone with full loads of Vietnamese soldiers. The five UH-1s will support them as before. Now with the H-21s at the loading zone. There is an early morning briefing by the H-21 company commander prior to the first flight. Flight routes and formations are discussed. All frequencies and call signs remain the same. Vietnamese who are to act as flight observers on the UH-1s are also carefully briefed. And the H-21 troop carriers take on their loads of Vietnamese soldiers. Ten men with their equipment into each big helicopter. The armed escort takes off, alert to cut down any Viet Cong who may be hiding in the ever-present jungle. The five tough little choppers circle to take their places as protectors of the air fleet, which is now setting out for the landing zone.
and the pattern of flight begins to evolve. In flight formation from loading zone to landing zone, the H-21 troop carriers fly in groups of five, with one minute of flying time between groups. The helicopters in each group fly a staggered pattern, not one behind the other, but separated by the width of two ships. When the distance to be flown is more than 15 miles, in Vietnam, the military expedient has been adopted of flying at an altitude of 1,500 feet, departing from the standard on-the-deck treetop level. This because of the limited number of heavy caliber weapons among the Viet Cong. To date, no H-21 has taken a hit of more than minor consequence at the 1,500-foot level. Protecting the formation are five armed escorts. Two of them escort the leading serial, parallel to the last H-21 of the group, and about 300 yards away on either side. From this position, they can look down on whoever or whatever may direct fire on their charges. The three other armed escorts are stacked some five or 600 feet above the formation, so placed that the tailing UH-1 will have the last H-21 of the final group and all its fellows under his constant surveillance. Experience has shown that five or at the most six armed escorts are sufficient to protect from five to 30 H-21s at the landing zone. The platoon leader of the armed escort is always in one of the three UH-1s stacked high above the formation. When the formation is from five to 10 miles from its destination, it is guided to the landing area by an Army L-19, which may be flying two or 3,000 feet high on a deceptive course. Its pilot is the operations officer of the H-21 company to which it is attached. By voice radio, the L-19 guides the battle fleet down to treetop level and then lines it up for making an accurate entry onto the chosen area. As the formation makes its final approach, all pilots receive the precise directions they need. Five degrees left. Five degrees left. Fine. Now, just over that line of trees. That's good. You're about one minute out. One minute out. The two foremost armed escorts have moved forward until they are perhaps a half minute ahead of the H-21s. Both UH-1s now sweep down the landing zone at from 50 to 75 feet elevation, the height depending upon that of the surrounding trees. When they reach the far end of the landing zone, each UH-1 turns and begins an elliptical course that brackets the field and covers its edges. Here, the UH-1B's four traversable M60 machine guns would give a devastating reply to Viet Cong fire. With this reassuring sight before them, the pilots of the first group of H-21s bring in their ships, maintaining the staggered positioning in their pattern of landing. Simultaneously, the three other UH-1s move forward at 500 feet height and fly a circular course that covers all the landing area. This completes the pattern pursued in armed escort of the troop carrying H-21s in flight and in the landing zone. It takes approximately 10 to 15 seconds to discharge the 10 Vietnamese soldiers from each H-21. As the groups fly one minute apart, the pilots and crews are under pressure to see that this unloading is done smartly. Then the troop carriers take off well in advance of the H-21 group following.
Now let's suppose that one H-21 is fired on when coming in and landing. Chalk 3, Chalk 3, receiving fire from the left, receiving fire from the left. Chalk 3 reporting fire from the left. The low-flying UH-1B closest to the Chalk 3 H-21 receives the platoon leader's command. Red 2, Red 2, direct fire on area to left of Chalk 3. Repeat, direct fire on area to left of Chalk 3, then join us up there. The UH-1B makes its run on the Viet Cong's hiding place. The gunner traversing the machine guns pours fire into the area. Then he flies up to join the daisy chain circling at the higher altitude. There he'll be able to use the lethal rockets prohibited him at the lower level, where he would be flying through the ricochet of his own rocket bursts. UH-1B on the other side of the landing zone continues to cover his assignment until all the H-21s have left the area. The daisy chain technique is to maintain continuous fire on the Viet Cong so that he never has a chance to come out from cover and fire. This pattern of protective fire has been extremely effective. The daisy chain type of operation lends itself to such action, which protects not only the H-21s, but also protects the UH-1s themselves. Fire from the Viet Cong on one landing of H-21s has rarely been repeated on later landings. Very rarely. As for the armed helicopters themselves, they have taken many hits, but only one of these tough airborne artillery batteries has been put out of action by enemy fire. So as the lurking enemy is being blasted, and with ground troops landed to mop up, the helleborne action is being won.